In today's video, brave Daredevil Henry Coetzee came face to face with a wild 15-foot alligator when he was out for a walk with his companions. What happened and how did his girlfriend react? Find out in the video. Welcome to Wild Assault. Henry Coetzee always anticipated his own demise. He frequently mentioned it while being aware that his life of adventure was hastening his passing, but his desire for adventure won out. He described experiencing a severe depression in his memoirs. Once every expedition was complete. When he was alone himself, straining himself to the very limit, he was only ever content. In South Africa, Henry was raised. While he struggled in school and found it uninteresting, he excelled in the arts. He traveled after receiving his degree before enlisting in the military at the age of 21. He was back on the desolate continent, searching for excitement. In 1997, travelers looking for adventure were flocking to the Great Zambezi River, which borders Zimbabwe and Zambia. Bungee jumps and skydives are organized by outfitters over the magnificent Victoria Falls. Yet whitewater rafting was the most well-liked activity. Henry, a brazen 21-year-old who had never rowed or kayaked a river before, managed to secure a position with Peter Meredith's whitewater rafting business. Henry first practiced rolling and paddling a kayak in a swimming pool before moving on to one of the most technologically advanced commercial rivers. He immediately gained popularity as a guide after leading tourists through grade 5 rapids. On one occasion, the entire gang had to portage their rafts and kayaks around hazardous class, according to Peter, who described Henry as having more balls than wits. Six quickly. Without alerting anyone, Henry took out on his kayak. He just about made it. In addition, he was the best. If he ever pulled a stunt like that again, Peter warned him he would lose his job. In 2004, Peter and Henry grew close. They assembled a small group and set out on an incredible journey. It was necessary to trace the River Nile from its source to the ocean. From Lake Victoria to the Mediterranean, they paddled together for 4,130 km. This came before Henry paddled the Congo by himself a few years later. He took five months to finish the journey. He escaped the Gumby tribesmen's cannibalistic ambushes and hunting. He avoided crocodiles and hippos. Only his bivouac and his fire provided protection while he dozed off on the riverbank. Henry decided it was time to calm down when he got home. This risk-taking way of life couldn't continue forever, and he was taking too many chances. After meeting a female, he came to the conclusion that there might be more to life than adrenaline-fueled adventures. Yet these emotions wouldn't linger for long. 2010 saw the arrival of an email address to professional American kayakers. Chris Corbett, Barry, and Ben Stokes wanted to travel up the Upper Congo River. Henry was recognized as the ideal tour leader for the task. Henry remained steadfast in his original choice. No more kayaking or exploring, but he was content to assist them in determining their course. He added specifics to his plan that only an explorer of his quality would be aware of. Henry experienced the same agitation as before as he planned their route. His ears heard the roar of the wild once more. After months of assisting them with their travel arrangements, Henry gave in to the allure of an epic adventure. On their two-month journey via the Congo's tributaries, the trio set out. They started off by easy river's path the final day of October 2010. By Christmas, they hoped to return home. After what he vowed would be his last journey, Henry's girlfriend was eager to see him again. It appears that he was correct. The three kayakers would chat with people who lived on the riverbanks whenever they stopped along the river to relax or set up camp. In exchange for some logistical assistance, they had a deal with the International Rescue Committee which provided assistance to rural populations and refugees. After speaking to one neighborhood, Henry had pledged to get opinions from the residents. They were informed that they required assistance in combating a significant crocodile problem in addition to clean water and education. 
This active predator had abducted 125 persons during the previous 20 years. Henry and the other took note of this remark in their minds. The group had been paddling for some time on December 7, 2010, when they encountered a sudden curve in the river. Henry had to teach Ben and Chris how to kayak in the African bush despite the fact that they were experienced paddlers and well-known in the extreme sports community. He instructed them on how to avoid eddies where hippos might attack and crocodiles lazing on the riverbanks by continuously tapping their kayaks and making noise. The three of them had seen a few three-foot crocodiles on the muddy banks the day before the attack. The trio sailed by savoring the natural environment from their toy boats. They were harmless. If an enormous crocodile was seen in the water, the three kayakers were to group up and paddle as quickly as they could to get away from the potential danger. Ben searched the canals and steep hillside for any indication of trouble, his eyes darting from left to right. There were no obvious evidence of crocodiles or hippos defending their territory because the river was so calm and the only ripples came from the men's paddles. Normally, they could see the two shining eyes and knobby protrusions of a crocodile's head barely above the water's surface. Today, though, was distinct. They had no idea that something was moving underwater. They were being followed by something from the dark depths. They had no way of knowing about this sly predator. Neither a bubble nor a ripple. Prior to it being too late, Ben checked to see if the others were maintaining form by looking back over his shoulder. Just to Hendry's left as he did this, he noticed a huge crocodile silently emerge from the water. Upon its abrupt arrival, Henry exclaimed, Oh my God, and gasped. It wasn't a cry of panic, fright, or despair. More to the point, said Ocean, Henry had been utterly caught off guard by the abrupt appearance of the largest crocodile lifting its head out of the water. He was only able to shout those few words. The crocodile seized Henry's left shoulder in its jaws in an instant. He was submerged instantly, like lightning, Henry thankfully passed unconscious before being pulled down under because of the extreme tightness on his body. The crocodile was estimated to be 15 feet long and more than 2,000 pounds based on the size of its head. Ben and Chris paddled ferociously as they made a wild push for it. Across the green and blue Cougar River, they swirled. They paddled their kayaks at the riverbed as they hurried to the riverside village of KPMG. They jumped out and rushed into the village while yelling for assistance. Locals ran away in a fit of hysteria. They were entirely unprepared for the two white males wearing helmets and life jackets who suddenly appeared. But after everyone had settled down, Ben and Chris were able to request a motorboat to search for Hendry. Hendry's girlfriend logged onto Facebook because she felt something was right. When condolence notes for Hendry started to show up on her screen, her heart skipped a beat. This cannot be taking place. There must be a mistake here. They were slated to meet shortly. He was getting close to finishing his journey. His very last journey. On New Year's Eve, Henry's girlfriend continued to make her way to the Ugandan bar where they had planned to meet thanks to the low illumination and heavy bass rhythm of the music. She looked all over the misty dance floor for Henry holding out hope after hope that she would spot that brilliant, self-assured smile emerge from the crowds. The timer rang out 12. Henry was not present when the partygoers broke out in cheers. He had met his unfortunate wild assault. 